There's a lot of research that's looked at the human level of those relationships, and I think where the next 10 years will be, we'll be understanding the underlying plausibility of that relationship from a biologic perspective. Specifically, what about sleep disrupts our human physiology? And I think that's very important for us to understand. When we think about healthy sleep, there's a variety of different ways we can describe it. I've kind of gone into the literature and just hit some key ones here um, to put them together for us. First of all, uh, everyone in here who isn't a student, right, and those of you online also, we probably need seven to nine hours of sleep. I would say the floor is seven, and most reports say eight is optimal. That is our personal volume target. For our students in here, and you can take this and share it with your parents and your professors, you probably need nine plus hours at your current stage in your life to effectively recoup the benefit of that sleep and to offset some of these sleep deprived outcomes. Um, we need good sleep quality. And I'm going to define that very brief as uh, a, a cycling of REM and non-REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement and non-rapid eye movement. But you need to go through about three or four cycles per night of that REM and non-REM sleep to harness the benefits that sleep can provide. So we certainly need good sleep quality. Uh, when we look at the data, we spend about 20 to 25 percent in REM sleep, rapid eye movement, you have eyeballs dancing around behind your eyelids, and then we spend about 75 to 80 percent of our time sleep in the non-rapid eye movement. And the non-rapid eye movement is the true restorative phase of sleep we need to be able to get to. Um, timing and regularity of sleep is critical. A bedtime and awake time is a key sleep hygiene metric that we work with our clients with or the patients we work with, trying to stick to that. And I know with students that's very difficult, right? To say I'm going to go to bed at 10 and wake at 6, there's a lot of factors that contribute to that. But timing and regularity has been shown to be equally one of the important variables of what quality sleep is. Um, the absence of sleep disturbances. And we probably have more than those than ever. Got one on your watch, on your wrist, you've got your phone, you've got people in your house, you've got cars, traffic, lights, I don't know, your iguana wakes up at night, eats a cricket, that could probably wake you up. So the idea is we need to have some way to reduce our sleep disturbances. And um, sleep hygiene is a common intervention that we use to do that when we talk to people about how to identify the disturbances to disrupt that sleep cycle and prevent you from cycling through that non uh, REM and non-REM sleep. And lastly, uh, where I'm going to focus a little bit on today, where my research is focused, is the absence of sleep disorders. They are prevalent, they are underdiagnosed, and you probably know more people who have them than do not. And it's uh, a recurring theme in the healthcare industry to try and identify these more and provide intervention and targets for folks here. So sleep, certainly wicked important. So when we talk about sleep recommendations and just what's out there, okay? So again, for most of the adults here in their you know, mid to late 20s and above, we need that seven hour window. That's probably our floor. If we're chronically under seven hours of sleep, and by chronic, from a diagnostic perspective, that's gonna be three months or 90 days. But from an acute perspective, it could be as little as a couple days. So a couple days of having sleep disruption to the point where you are not consuming seven plus hours of quality sleep, we can, we can find a couple of these adverse uh, side effects that we see. Folks who traditionally or consistently, excuse me, sleep less than seven hours a day are associated with high weight gain and obesity. Certainly a pandemic in this country with 66% of adults in the overweight and obese category. Um, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, stroke, depression, and increased mortality. I hope that list alone would empower you to say, I'm getting seven hours of sleep, lights out, but unfortunately we don't. But these are again, very uh, associated driven, very population level uh, relationships we see here. And I think we are moving forward uh, as a collective body to understand the plausibility connecting these relationships. Also, when we look at folks with less than seven hours of sleep, they tend to report uh, experience uh, impaired immune function, increased pain in a chronic pain setting. If you think in a rehab setting, if you're dealing with arthritic pain, 
heartbreak pain could be exacerbated by poor sleep quality more so than any other potential intervention. So there's, there's a link there. So you can, you can see that link when it happens. Uh, obviously, impaired performance, increased errors, right? So errors across the board, cognitive errors, physical errors, performance errors, and greater risk of accidents. So really, there's enough evidence to say for us as adults, we really need that seven hour uh, volume of quality sleep to offset the likelihood or the risk of some of these uh, adverse behaviors or, or conditions. Now, there are some conditions where we have shown in the research nine hours or more is better. And again, it's gonna be for middle school and high school kids. So those of you with children in that age, and if they're sleeping a long time, it's been shown to be very effective for their growth and development and cognitive functioning. That's not a child that's being lazy or spending too much time in bed, but there's some biologic drive to need nine plus hours there. And just anecdotally, just on NPR, literally two days ago, they have a national referendum on trying to move the start of high school days to a later time to accommodate this a little bit of time to the circadian rhythm of two of these younger people and also to provide them with uh, the optimal learning environment from a sleep perspective. Uh, those of you recovering from sleep debt, so many of you, unfortunately, students and you're lovely, are going to experience sleep debt starting, I believe, so December 9th with your final exam week. And so you're likely to just not get your optimal time, just being awesome and studying and getting up early and doing all that stuff. We have shown if you experience that sort of debt, you probably need to get to a recovery phase of at least nine hours consistently to offset the potential impact of that sleep debt that you incur. So certainly students and likewise faculty working so hard to help our students out, uh, having a recovery phase following sleep debt where we try to achieve nine plus hours is a really um, strong recommendation that we are seeing here. And lastly, any patients we work with or any clients we work with that are recovering from illness, and this is a very broad definition of illness, flu, cold, COVID, um, some surgical illness or whatever the case is, that restorative sleep in those populations tends to begin around nine hours a night. So again, uh, a very strong uh, link that we see here. Um, we can all in this room, and I won't do it, although I love reflective learning, and I won't do any reflective learning today, but we can all describe how we feel when we are sleep deprived, right? We can all anecdotally probably give me a list of, I was up all night, I didn't get the sleep I need, it's Friday, and I'm tired. And so what we see is when we get less than six hours, which is where a lot of America lives in that six hour sleep window, uh, six hours is associated acutely with cognitive distress. And that's effectively described as depression, anxiety, decision making, and self doubt. A lot of those symptoms manifest. So if you didn't sleep well, and you're really stressed out the next day, it's not your fault. There is some connection there between that loss of sleep and that cognitive decline the next day. I would like to use these next two to just make sure we're working on a similar definition in terms of sleepiness versus fatigue. Um, we often use them interchangeably and they are not in fact the same thing. But from a sleep research and sleep medical perspective, sleepiness is in fact feeling like you need to sleep during the day. Okay, so that's really exclusively how we would use that. So that's, you didn't sleep all well, you get to work and that head on the desk phenomenon just looks delightful. Right? You feel like sleeping with your head on your desk, that would be an occurrence of sleepiness. It's the presence of sleepiness during your normal daytime cycle. In contrast, fatigue is about muscle fatigue and about loss of muscle performance. And it's separate than sleepiness alone. Okay? So again, a fair amount of evidence here, both some that I've presented with my colleagues and some that many uh, are sort of our benchmark studies show that both acute and chronic sleep does in fact promote cognitive distress. So there's no doubt about it. If you don't sleep well tonight, you may experience a sleep-promoted measure of cognitive distress the next day. Likewise, sleep loss uh, does in fact promote sleepiness. Sometimes science has to answer the low-hanging fruit question first, but yes, if you do not sleep well at night, you will feel sleepy during the day. So I, I always love the entry-level science that we can present here. And um, there's actually a growing area and where my research towards the end of this talk will look at is that acute and chronic sleep loss does seem to reduce metabolic activity at the muscle cell level. 
Uh, there's a whole host of potential causative factors in there, and I can only present one in terms of our research aim. But it's pretty well established right now that sleep does, in fact, disrupt metabolic activity of the muscle, both for athletes and non athletes alike. So there's, there's some causation there for sure. All right. Sleep disorders. Very common, very prevalent. They are, are probably our most um, prolific sleep disruptors that we have in our country right now. They are going to be the clinical diagnosis of one of these six categories that I have right here for you all. Okay? Sleep disorders are diagnosed by sleep physicians. Sleep physicians are generally pulmonologists or neurologists in most cases, and or in some cases you may have podiatrists in the rehab side that are able to do diagnostic uh, for true sleep disorders. That would be determined from a true sleep avail and a clinical assessment and so on. Uh, CPT codes and billing exist for all of these sleep disorders. They are equally viewed in the medical community as type 2 diabetes, cancer, or stroke. So they are, in fact, diagnostic conditions. Um, insomnia can be diagnosed. You can experience acute insomnia. That can be diagnosed. We all understand, certainly, uh, what insomnia is. We experience it quite a bit. Uh, Sleep-related movement disorders. Very common one here would be restless leg syndrome. Very, very common sleep disorder we see here. Uh, the sleep-related breathing disorders, which are an uh, area I'm really interested in, obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea fall in that realm. Uh, OSA is an area I'm particularly interested in as it works within the obese phenotype where I spent a fair amount of my time doing um, research. Um, hypersomnolence, yes, that's the narcolept, the person that falls asleep randomly throughout the day. That's a clinical diagnosis that is a cognitive impairment that does disrupt sleep. Uh, parasomnias, sleepwalkers, they really exist. You can be diagnosed as a sleepwalker. It scares me, particularly if my wife is not a sleepwalker. I don't know if this is very typical to have sleeping people walking around the house. But uh, parasomnias are, in fact, uh, a, a, a diagnostic sleep disorder. And lastly, circadian rhythm sleep wake disorders. Very common in shift workers in our military, but essentially what happens with these circadian rhythm sleep wake disorders, we're wide awake at midnight and we're dying to get to bed at 12 noon. So you're sort of off that daylight, nighttime, normal cycle that guides a lot of our uh, sleep pathways. Um, so I could just talk a little bit about obstructive sleep apnea, which is the condition I'm most interested in in terms of conducting research, both because of its prevalent rates and the fact that, um, again, as I said, in the obese phenotype group, which we work with a lot in exercise physiology, there's a very common comorbidity that's there. Um, OSA is a common nighttime sleep disorder that's associated with apneas and hypopneas. Okay, and if I can, I don't want to use the laser, so can you see my little cursor? Oh, you cannot see my little cursor. Normal, normal airway, you can see right here. An apnea and a hypopnea are two distinct disruptions of that airway that happen multiple times per hour at night. An apnea is a complete occlusion. So we can see the normal airway coming in through the mouth and the nasal, moving down to the airway to oxygenate the alveoli in the, in the lung. In an apneic case, you have complete occlusion of the airway. It can manifest from both a relaxation of the tongue that slides back and occludes the airway, or a large neck circumference that can, in fact, collapse the airway. And again, that's where it's highly prevalent, and obesity tends to be more of that etiology there. But essentially, no air. So we all know, hopefully enough, that's bad. If you aren't getting air in your lungs, particularly when you're unconscious, laying flat in a dark room, possibly by yourself. Um, a hypopnea is really just a partial occlusion where there's at least a 30% retention of airflow, but a drop of roughly 20 to 30% of oxygen saturation. So the airflow is sufficient that the person's oxygen saturation proportion is dropping to a clinical level here. Um, again, it's about 6 to 10% of the population. But I would argue it is probably the single most undiagnosed sleep disorder out there. Insomniacs, uh, 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 circadian rhythm disorders, a lot of these conditions are more likely to report to the physician and be evaluated 
This gets lost in the story. So uh, although it's not causative, if you snore, you possibly have a form of obstructive sleep apnea. And so many folks write it off as, oh, I'm just a snorer. And so it, it commonly goes undiagnosed. The problem is it's progressive, it's persistent, and it's chronic. And so it's not going to go away, right? And it's, we can do exercise, and we'll talk about that later. The common diagnostic criteria for severity of OSA is the apnea hypopnea index. This would be derived from a standard sleep study, both one in a sleep clinic or a, or a sleep study in your house. And our scorings are sorted here in terms of number of events per hour. So I want you to conceptualize this. The average hypopnic event is like 30 some seconds, okay? I've seen some up to 120 seconds of, of apnea. So that's almost two minutes of air occlusion through the airway. So the AHI score is counting those number of events per hour to create a severity score. So most of us in here probably have one or two a night, and they would be non-OSA. They're just a variety of factors that may contribute to it. Mild OSA is going to be someone who's experiencing 5 to 14 of these events per hour. Moderate is going to be 15 to 30, and severe is going to be greater than 30 apneic or hypopic events per hour. So conceptualize what that means in terms of that, that apnea hypopnea uh, cycle you have someone that's really consistently desaturating their oxygen and leading to a sympathetic nervous system arousal, which I'll, I'll show in a figure in a moment. Uh, the research I'm going to present, our, our group is around 46 HI scores. So they were all severe. I've seen as high as 70 to 80 events an hour, and those are obviously quite, quite severe. So, oops, wrong arrow. So when we look at OSA and why I'm kind of interested in it, in terms of a kind of a functional model of what OSA is, you have some apneas and hypopneas that occur. Those can cycle through from five an hour to 60, 70 an hour. They promote two conditions systemically. Hypoxia, which is low oxygen in the blood, and hypercapnia, which is high carbon dioxide in the blood. We know that is generally not good. Our body operates the exact opposite, ideally. What this hypoxia and hypercapnia promotes is a sudden a sympathetic nervous system arousal, very much online with a traditional stress response. Like, <clears throat> right? we can all, we've experienced these, we know it's a quick arousal. And that arousal can be conscious or unconscious. Most patients I've worked with talk about they have no idea it's happening. Their partner sure does. But no one idea. That's associated with a sudden spike in heart rate and a sudden vasodilatory effect to increase blood pressure and blood flow because we're suddenly low on oxygen, high in CO2, and we need to support uh, metabolic life. These arousals disrupt sleep architecture. They break your REM, non-REM sleep. They break that nice three, four cycles, seven, eight hour window of sleep you need. And they ultimately do that to try and regulate that blood gas that needs to be regulated. So you go hypoxic, hypercapnic, you suddenly have a stress response, you breathe wicked hard, your heart rate jams up really quick, you normalize blood level, you kind of fall back to sleep a bit, and then it happens all over again. So when we look at OSA as a model of disrupting metabolic function, it is a chronic repetitive strain that is driving a lot on the um, sympathetic nervous system and microvascular control. And so it's, it's a great model for us to look at to understand that link between uh, performance and, and uh, uh, OSA. All right, so when we just talk about the OSA phenotype, I've kind of talked about it a little bit, but if you look at attributes of patients who are reporting uh, OSA, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, Generally speaking, the phenotype is going to have obesity and overweightness. So if we use our traditional BMI scale of 30 or greater for the obese group and the 25 to 29.9 for overweight group, those are some at-risk variables there. And we can certainly argue about the limitation of that, that measure. But they tend to be hypertensive. And again, remember OSA has some sympathetic dysregulation tied to it, and they tend to have some measure of hypertension here as a sort of risk factor for them. Often they are sedentary. It's, it's, it's not hard to recruit uh, inactive OSA patients to be in research studies. Often it's a common attribute that they are in fact not 
um, engaged in activity. But many metric we would use in our field to assess that. And sadly, they often have type 2 diabetes. So when we look at the OSA phenotype, that is a complex formation of health outcomes that we would call metabolic syndrome, which is a really big um, problem in our country with a high rate of metabolic syndrome in this world. Uh, I, I didn't want to show all my research, but I just want to show, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we do have shown some early work that I've done here with colleagues of mine at uh, Emory and at Arkansas and now at Texas that we show exercise independent of modifying some of these outcomes can in fact reduce the burden directly of the apnea hypopnea index. So what we've shown is, is in, our, in our programming is older adults that add physical activity in fact can reduce the burden of OHA independent of any other modification of health outcome. So again, starting to show a little bit of that connection between physical vigor, sleep disruption, OSA, modifying performance, increased performance, overall exercise load, therefore potentially modify the burden of the disease. Um, this work that we did was at seven nursing homes across the country, and we looked at this with adults over 80, and their exercise for my colleagues in here that are savvy in that was very basic. It was chest press, leg press, and walk as far as you could in the hallway. By MET standards, their exercise intervention was pretty much light by our standards, so it's not rigorous. And many of them did two or three sets of eight with one or two plates on the machine. So we showed some efficacy here and simply using exercise to attenuate that burden of sleep apnea here. So again, some really interesting work. And, and uh, I'm not presenting the uh, University of Lynchburg's active aging program today. I'm going to save that for something we have planned in the, in the fall. But we have used some of that information from these earlier studies to apply to exercise interventions of human growing adults that many uh, uh, students in my program have been a part of. Okay. So the next two things are going to be some actual research uh, conducted here specifically in a couple of areas. Um, my second aim of this study was to convince you that you need to be concerned about sleep disorders, that if you are a practitioner, you need to ask your clients about sleep disorders. If you or a client has a comorbidity, you need to be concerned about sleep disorders. My argument here is we're gonna to try to describe the relationship from a very much a population public health perspective um, between sleep disorders, physical functioning, and health status here. Um, this was a really enjoyable project that I did using the uh, NHANES data set, which is publicly available and my research team was undergraduate students, doctoral students, and colleagues from around a couple different institutions. We had a wonderful time doing this. Um, NHANES, if you haven't heard of it before, is a federally funded ongoing health and nutrition examination survey. We pop up around the country in a variety of different physical spaces or mobile trailers or pop-up tents, and we basically collect data from people in every demographic and every environment in our country. Urban, rural, suburban, wealthy, middle income, low income, immigrant, non-immigrant status, healthy, you know, all the, all the different racial studies you see. And we collect this data continuously and we make it available every two years. You can log in right now and get a data set and see what's there. It's really cool to be able to do this sort of work. It's often foundational for many of us to, to look at some of these large scale data sets here. They use surveys, interviews, and some conditions physical examinations here, okay? And the data can have some very consistent regular markers, age, race, weight, married, single, ethnicity, are you active, are you not active, the doctor said you have cancer, and they can get into doing some more one-off or emergent questions, such as do you have a sleep disorder, do you have functional impairment? So they have some consistently asked questions that we can pull data from, and then they also have some ones that are more relevant to Okay, uh, so here's our first question with this data set. And here's why these data sets are awesome. We had 10 years of data from 2004 to 2014. We had just under 51,000 respondents. That's just awesome to be able to work with such a large data set. Our first question within this data set was, what's the odds of physical functioning being associated with a sleep disorder? So how likely did someone who reported having impairment in their physical functioning 
also report being diagnosed with a physician diagnosed sleep disorder. So very much population level data. Okay? So we have, again, we have a 10 year analysis data here. We have 51,000 in this, uh, just under 51,000 in this, in this analysis here. We were able to extract 10 self-report physical ability questions that were asked. They were binary, yes or no. We created a composite score excuse me, from these questions. This is exactly how the questions are organized in the end paint here. Can you walk a quarter mile? Yes, no. Can you walk up 10 stairs without resting? Yes, no. Student crouch kneel, lift or carry 10 pounds. Can you do chores around the house? Can you walk between rooms? Can you sit for two hours? Can you reach above your head? Can you stand from an armless chair? Can you push or pull objects in front of you? So again, standard questions, binary response. We collected all of these and then created a composite score from that to rank folks physical functioning accordingly. Okay? I will quickly shout out to my doctoral student who had to do this, as you can imagine the data set. Uh, Matt Fugelkan, this was a massive undertaking. I think it was two months in the world to pull this together. Um, and then likewise, a binary question, have you ever been diagnosed with a doctor um, sleep disorder? So that's our question here. That included uh, restless leg, insomnia, and OSA were the three sleep disorders they prefaced that question with. Okay, so full the available data set, self-report, certainly some bias in there, certainly some limitation, but this is really how a lot of this type of research starts. So first question here. We actually saw some really interesting stuff. So just for the sake of providing a, a little perspective for you guys, we use the odds ratio statistic. It's a very common statistic in this type of research. And the odds ratio, it allows us to answer the question of what's the likelihood that exposure to physical functioning led to the outcome of a sleep disorder. So an odds ratio is a, is a statistic used in epi-style research to say if you're exposed to this factor, does it lead to this outcome? Okay, so that was our sort of target there. So did your physical functioning score, that exposure, lead to the prevalence of sleep disorders in your additional responses? Okay, odds ratio is on basically a scale of one. If it's a one equal number, that means there's really no potential influence there. There's no association there. There's no odds that one leads to the other. If it's greater than one, the exposure, physical functioning, is associated with a sleep disorder. So it's a way for us at a population level to say, oh, these folks with sleep disorder probably had a strong measure, uh, increase, uh, pardon, these folks with uh, functional impairment probably had a high odds of having a sleep disorder. And if it's less than one, it's essentially an inverse relationship. So that would be, for example, decreased physical functioning is associated with a decrease in sleep disorder. So well, oh, I jumped over my stack. So all of that, I'm just a little red. Our odds ratio here for this first relationship showed that folks that reported um, a high level of functional impairment or having a high composite score of limitations, the exposure of reduced physical functioning had a 1.41 odds ratio of having and developing a sleep disorder. So within 51,000 respondents, we were able to show if you had decreased physical functioning, it was highly likely you also had a sleep disorder. Okay, so it's very much on that surface level. We can't dig into causation. There's not a ton of really any biologic plausibility there outside of a theoretical framework, but it's where a lot of this research starts. We then wanted to expand because we don't want to live in a vacuum, and then we added comorbidities. Because right? health can interfere also. So we took our same data set and we went in there, and this end ended dropping down to about 14,000 because we were looking at folks who identified as having one of our selected comorbidities. We put them into five subcategories here. So folks that had a cognitive comorbidity, which would be depression, anxiety, or emotional disorder, again, self-report. Folks that had cardiovascular or pulmonary comorbidity, which was heart disease, hypertension, uh, uh, lung breathing problems, asthma was included in that, and or stroke, metabolic diabetes, weight problem, muscle skeletal arthritis, rheumatism, bone and neck and injury problem, and then cancer was inclusive. So if you reported on cancer, you were in this group. Our first analysis was just under 51,000. 
but we did have many folks that had co comorbidities, and so we eliminated this analysis down. It was around 14, 5,000 respondents, so nobody was in more than one category here. So we're able to look at how does physical functioning, along with the exposure of comorbidity, how does that increase the odds of sleep disorder in this group, okay? Um, and these were some staggered results. And this uh, probably is one of the main results that ended up getting this paper published for us in, in a pretty decent journal, uh, was we were able to show physical functioning does in fact contribute to the prevalence of sleep disorder, but comorbidity was one of the greater exposures that probably predicted the fact that client or patient group did in fact have a sleep disorder. So if we look at our comorbid groups here, and frankly, I'm not surprised by really any of these. Cognitive impairment groups, depression, depression anxiety, and or, um, I can't remember the other one, had an odds ratio or an odds of 2.45. So functional, a decline in physical functioning along with these comorbid capacities, we were at a 2.45% odds of developing a sleep disorder. So if you think of it from a translational perspective for our students, we can start to you know, identify clients we work with and we maybe need to ask, do you have a sleep disorder? So we're going to work with a ton of folks with cognitive impairments, particularly as they age, and folks that have physical decline, and start to get a sense of maybe they're at that increased odds of having that. Pulmonary disease, very similar to what we saw with physical functioning alone, metabolic impairment, and musculoskeletal impairments uh, equally uh, show to, to increase the odds of having that um, sleep disorder. We don't understand this. We don't. We, 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 we tried, and in our paper, we're like, hey, this is what the, the data said, what the data said. Um, I personally would feel cancer is something that can be sleep disrupting in terms of both diagnostic care and recovery. We don't have an answer for this, but this would suggest in some way cancer reduces the odds of a sleep disorder in physical function. But you know, the data is what the data is, and it's self report data, and it has its limitations. So what do we what do we learn from here? Uh, physical functioning status was associated with um, physician diagnosed sleep disorder. So for those of us working in rehab settings or in exercise settings, if we have a client we're working with that has a physical limitations and we assess that in a variety of different ways in our field there's a good chance they have an underlying sleep disorder, whether it's diagnosed or not, and it's certainly a worthy target of question and intervention. So it's a really good way to start. We saw that folks who had decreased physical functioning along with the presence of comorbidity, that risk of a sleep disorder increased even more. So again, think of the clinic, think of the clinical setting. We're gonna be working with folks that have low functional capacity, have a variety of comorbidities. We need to start asking, in fact, is there some underlying sleep disorder. And so really how I, I translate that is we need to add this to our lens of interpretive and questioning with our clients. Even if it's at the population level and we're simply looking at odds, it doesn't hurt to ask. This is a non-invasive question. So screening for comorbidities and identifying groups um, who have comorbidity, morbidity, the comorbidities, it may be worth asking them sleep hygiene or health or sleep behavior tools, and certainly leading to a recommendation of sleep to the clinic. And then likewise, uh, folks with low functional capacity is worth asking them about sleep outcomes also and sleep behavior here. We know exercise can remediate that, and we also know referral to sleep clinic can be a way to get that effectively diagnosed. I will say in the Union University of Lynchburg Active Aging program, my students, we have in fact added this to our health screening questionnaire where we reported a positive effect of our intervention on reducing uh, sleep, improving sleep quality in uh, February on our results here. So it has translated down to the classroom and also uh, into our interventional program. Okay. So my third aim was hopefully we can build a collaborative network here. And I've learned this method I'm going to talk about here, my, my time at the uh, National Institute of Health. And I learned this methodology, and I would love to bring it here and build a collaborative network to answer the relationship between sleep and fatigue with the muscle cell. Um, so 
So again, what we talk about here is the population level and at the experimental level, we do see that uh, obstructive sleep apnea and fatigue are associated. They're commonly reported. Folks do report tiredness and sleepiness, but what they report most is a measure of loss in performance. Right? They experience that muscle fatigue. When I'm talking fatigue, for those of you, I'm, I'm talking specifically peripheral fatigue, so we're looking in the muscle cell. Not central fatigue, we're not looking at efferent signals or any sort of regulation from the cognitive higher orders. We're really looking at the fatigue that manifests itself in the sarcomere, right at the active myosin intervention, and I'll, and I'll show a model for that. So this research I'm going to show you that we've done, really, here's our question. How does obstructive sleep apnea promote reported fatigue in the skeletal muscle? How does sleeping or disrupting your sleeping modify how your muscle metabolizes? Just an incredibly broad connection. There's so many potential assumptions in there, and we've done our best to try and trickle them out. Um, my good colleague, Randy Kieser, wrote this paper a few years ago to really sort of take a position on what exactly muscle fatigue is. It manifests in the skeletal muscle, and ultimately muscle fatigue is attenuated cross-bridge function. Active myosin, tropomyosin is not functioning optimally. The power stroke is reduced. That's exclusively what peripheral fatigue is. You get an accumulation of hydrogen, largely dependent on deficient oxygen in the cell. That hydrogen competes for calcium in the active myosin complex and interferes with that strong binding site. So it's an oxygen dependent process that leads to hydrogen competition for um, the active myosin cross bridge calcium binding sites. Right? So when it all comes down to it, all these potential contributors to this phenomenon, right? Circulatory insufficiency, pulmonary insufficiency, hormonal dysregulation, all of those can modify available oxygen in the cell and therefore promote a situation where there's accumulated hydrogen and that therefore competes with calcium and it leads to, to muscle fatigue. Okay? So how does this get me to where I'm talking about here? Well, this type of research is incredibly theoretical from its start. And I firmly believe in OSA, because of what we've seen at the population level with hypertension and increased peripheral resistance, the, the repetitive strain of sympathetic nervous system arousal, doing those nighttime events, we could be getting into a position where the sympathetic regulation of microvascular function is compromised, meaning it's insufficiently dilating and perfusing oxygen into the muscle cell. And so this was our first sort of target to figure out, is this in fact where fatigue in this group is manifesting. Um, uh, my students will tell you I'm a big figure one person. I love starting research from figure one. It's our roadmap. So if you'll allow me a um, slightly selfish uh, presentation of my favorite figure one I've ever made. Um, if we start up here with obstructive sleep apnea and we understand that standard arousal, right? Apnea hypopnea is to have the arousal, sleep fragmentation, you get the sympathetic nervous system awakening breathe, fall back to sleep, and you get this repetitive strain. What we've shown is that these situations lead to reduced vascular reactivity and an increase in total peripheral resistance. So we've got this fairly established in the literature, and this leads to our assumption to why OSA patients that are hypertensive, that they have this dysregulated vascular system that leads to uh, hypertension and obviously risk for stroke. So for, oops. so my question comes over here then, right? We have the OSA, we have the vascular reactivity. We theorize in our framework that there is reduced uh, reduction in blood flow through the microcirculation. So this sympathetic nervous system, this regulation, if you will, reduces the capacity to dilate vessels to perfuse blood into the muscle leading ultimately to a drop in both myoglobin and mitochondrial oxygen content, leads to metabolic defects, and then leads to that chronic uh, fatigue in a little physical capacity. Okay. So that sort of working theoretical framework, we build an argument that we feel fatigue in OSA is really down at the microvasculature. Okay, so um, I'll do my best to kind of get through this real quick so we can have questions. I was 36 minutes on my own, I promise. <laughs> um, two research questions came off of this massive collaboration, and, and this is with colleagues of mine at NIH and the Clinical Center, 
Um, colleagues of mine at Wayne State, colleagues at uh, uh, George Mason University and at George Washington University. Uh, we've recruited collectively a nice little collaborative group to, to do this work. But our first question here is, are microvascular responses impaired in adults with sleep apnea? We'll start at the base of what our framework is asking. And then, does that OSA severity predict fatigue in performance of OSA patients? Um, so this study, which was about two years in the, in the making, and we're still playing with the data now, we got a paper published in the Little Women Review, um, our participants in this group were two populations, folks with OSA, folks without OSA. They needed to be free of cardiopulmonary and metabolic disease, so no heart disease, no lung disease, no COPD. We ruled out asthma, we really wanted clean OSA patients, and, and likewise. But, and here was the trick, here's what made it difficult for us, they also needed to be physically inactive. So we were sort of looking for the research uniform in terms of a population there. But it was very experimental, and we wanted to make sure we controlled all the variables we could. A couple of the testings we did, and I'll talk about these in greater detail, but we looked at tissue oxygenation using years, and I'll go over that in a moment. We did some exercise testing, we did some constant work rate, and then we did a standard fatigability test, which I will go over to give a couple of our outcomes. So in our study, here's our experimental protocol conclusion. We did this NEARS test, which I'll describe in a moment. Then we had them do some exercise tests, studying NEARS. And then we established their anaerobic threshold for exercise during day two. Day two was an up-down constant work rate on the treadmill where we were looking at essentially fatiguing them and then seeing how they reported fatigue on an overground test using a very standard questionnaire. The research I'm going to present answers this question and answers this question right here. Um, okay. So near infrared spectroscopy. Um, I never would have thought I worked with lasers when I started my PhD, but this is a laser and I feel pretty fancy talking to you about a laser today. <laughs> um, but near-infrared spectroscopy is really a groundbreaking piece of technology because it provides a continuous, non-invasive wave of total hemoglobin and oxygenated hemoglobin. So if you know total hemoglobin and you know oxygenated hemoglobin and you're able to look at changes over time, you can look at the rise of deoxyhemoglobin, and you can look at a sort of kinetic change in that O2 oxyhemoglobin structure. The way we use NEARS is we take a giant, and I mean giant, occlusion cuff, big blood pressure cuff, put it over our patient's thigh, right mid-thigh, kind of mid-femur, and we strap the NEARS to their gastrocnemius on some standardized sites. The gastroc in our field is commonly used as a highly oxidative tissue, to evaluate these methods on. What's great is it basically is taped to the back of the lower leg. We then inflate that cuff to three, four hundred millimeters of mercury, which is mega tight, and we basically perfuse blood from that cuff down. So this is collecting um, here. Let's just look at what we have here in terms of tissue saturation. So this is oxygen saturation in the blood. These are just arbitrary units. Don't get hung up on the number. Nears does not give a PO2 value or a percent value. It's literally just an arbitrary unit. But so here we take that cough and we inflate it with a machine that goes from zero to 400 millimeters of mercury in about three seconds. It's a heck of a machine. It was like 40 grand. I can't believe we paid for that, but it worked. So we occluded almost instantaneously and our patients do that very quickly. So we occlude right here so no blood is moving to where this is set on the lower leg. We are then able to look at drop in tissue saturation as that occlusion happens, as that ischemia is promoted. So everybody falls asleep, they look at us, and they beg us to turn it off, and we follow our informed consent, of course. Um, but we encourage them to just a little bit longer. Um, as you can see here, it takes about eight minutes, and then we're done. And we tell them, look how lovely it feels when we reperfuse. That's like a delightful feeling. Don't you want to feel that reperfusion? Um, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. When you see our end, you'll sort of realize how many said didn't get out of you. Um, so we occlude, and we basically desaturate all the tissue. Right? So there's no oxygen in the tissue. We look for this plateau. We see this plateau. We then reperfuse. Just like our cuff occludes, it quickly reperfuses and sucks all the air out. So we get an instantaneous reperfusion. And what we're able to look at right here is that microvascular reactivity. We're able to see how quickly that microvasculature allows oxygen desaturation 
in the tissue level. Okay, so it's really all coming right here from that near tracing. So if you let me shift to the right a little bit in terms of what we see here in terms of our data, here's our, um, our TSI total saturation index. But our hemo oxyhemoglobin is red, obviously as we include, hemoglobin drops. Right? So we basically there's no re reoxygenation occurring. If we look at our deoxyheme, which is the blue, we obviously see a rise in deoxy. That's, you know, in science, you love when the basic things happen. We tried to do that, and we consistently showed that happen. We then look at total hemoglobin, which is our score here. Generally speaking, you don't want much more than a 6% deviation in total hemoglobin, because that can suggest something else is modifying that red cell count in there. You, you really want this to remain pretty static. And we were pretty consistently happy with that one in our subjects. And then here, the yellow is just the difference between oxy and deoxy. Okay? So we're able to look here and see how quickly this reperfuses. And we're able to look at the amplitude in which that reperfusion happens. And from that, make an assertion on um, uh, the microvascular reactivity of that tissue. I want to talk about the fatigability score because we will learn this in uh, 4.6 in the spring. Uh, but the Schnell fatigability test is standard, excuse me, standard field test, 10 minute walk test, 50 meter lap, walk at a comfortable pace. We're able to determine someone's perceived fatigability and we're able to determine someone's performance fatigability. The little questionnaire folder right here, we ask them pre, before you start walking, what's your reported Fatigue score, one, or two, or three, or four. And then when they're done on that 10 minute walk, we ask them their post fatigability score, then we plug it into the regression formula that Snell has, and we get a composite fatigability score here from this group in terms of their perceived change in fatigability over that 10 minute window. Performance fatigability is really looking at the distance traveled in the first two and a half minutes and creating a meters per second variable and then from 2.5 to 10, getting meters per second there and looking at the change there. So if they were, for example, 15 meters per second here and 10 meters per second here, we would have seen a measure of fatigue contributing to that loss in pace. Okay? So again, very standard in rehab work to do a, sort of a perceived performance fatigability here. Um, really quick, I'm just pointing out a few things here. I want to get to just some key findings and then we'll wrap up. Uh, our group here was around middle age. If you look at our AHI scores here, our OSA group was in the severe range, around 46.8. We had no scoring for our non-OSA, so that is a potential limitation of the data. We didn't ask them to be screened. They just self-report, I have non-OSA here. If you look at body mass index, no surprise. We built a case that obesity is associated with OSA. No surprise here. Neck circumference, a little bit of a difference here. So these folks were a little bit thicker girth in the neck, which can be a risk factor for OSA. Um, so let's just look at a couple of cool factors here on our data. So we want to look here at the reperfusion capacity. So we occlude, we promote ischemia, and then we reperfuse. That's where we get our microvascular reactivity indicator for. Do the vessels respond sufficiently to reperfuse the cell that's been hypoxic for eight to nine minutes? So we use um, uh, the maximal hyperemic response, which again is looking at the difference here of that reperfusion phase. And what we showed here was that the maximal response in OSA was reduced compared to the non-OSA response. So what that tells us is the microvasculature has a reduced capacity to reperfuse. Okay? Again, meaning we're not getting oxygen to the muscle cell, the mitochondrial is, is unable to oxidize and get the accumulation of hydrogen. So we were really excited to see this. Then we wanted to look at reactive rate, okay? the reperfusion rate, which is how quickly does this happen. Right? So there's a slope vector in here that we would look at, but how quickly do we go from um, Deoxy to quickly oxy. So this is sort of a time constant. And we use this in, in our field to describe um, the reactivity of, 
of response. And what we showed here was our OSA group, it took longer to reperfuse. Remember, they were ultimately at a lower level than our non-OSA group here. So we showed there might have been some reactivity impairments in our OSA group. You guys mind if I just jump to my conclusion page to take questions? There's more than likely to be that I will. I swear to God, it was 36 minutes this morning. <laughs> but you're just so delightful to talk to, I just can't get away. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead and just get to my conclusions on some of these results. I'll gladly share this slide with you if you want it at home. So what did this research show us? Um, OSA appears to reduce oxygen, uh, the capacity to oxygenate tissue compared to non-OSA. So there seems to be some reactivity phenomenon in there. It appears to delay that um, response, and, to, and that, again, would be our reactivity problem that we see. What we did find were folks that had a uh, delay also reported the highest level of both performance and perceived fatigability. So we showed the mechanism at play and then how it translated to the perceptions and performance of the individual. Okay, so I have my questions. I apologize for going along. Thank you.